It seems weird to me the fourth installment of the Castlevania franchise includes the prefix super as well as the suffix for. Like the marketing team couldn't decide if they should advertise this as the fourth game in the franchise or to celebrate the first Castlevania title on the Super Nintendo. Despite being the fourth title in the franchise, Castlevania 4 is a retelling of Simon's original adventure, updated both technically, taking advantage of the then new 16-bit hardware, as well as mechanically, with a massive overhaul to the gameplay. While modern audiences may not always appreciate the evolution of a game series, changes were generally accepted during the 1990s. Be it Mario, Zelda, or Metroid, there was little backlash when a series marched onward. Mario continued his evolution towards a wider audience with easier gameplay. Zelda followed suit with waypoints helping with progression and more healing items. And of course, Metroid evolved from a bomb every floor labyrinth to something far more thoughtful. So it should be no surprise the development team massaged the Castlevania formula. The biggest change comes in the form of the whip. In the classic trilogy, Simon's whip was a simple melee item able to launch forward to damage foes. In Castlevania 4, the whip is so much more. First, it can be flicked in all eight directions, which has the greatest benefit of hitting enemies above. It can also be used as a shield, deflecting certain attacks. It can sort of be wiggled around, damaging enemies in unusual ways. Finally, it can be used to swing off specific hooks, adding an Indiana Jones element to the gameplay. On the surface, this could be viewed as a negative. As others have stated more eloquently, the increased utility of the whip greatly reduces the utility of the sub-weapons. One of the main elements of the previous Castlevanias was finding the best item to use in different situations, like the axe against the bat, or the cross against the owls, or the holy water against death. Experimenting with different items was a trademark of the franchise, and thanks to unlimited continues, experimentation was encouraged and rewarded. However, as Simon's whip can now melee in all directions, one doesn't need holy water to damage an enemy below, or an axe to hit an enemy above, and to this extent, the argument the whip is too powerful and negates the need for sub-weapons is persuasive. On the flip side, the improved whip does have positive impacts on the gameplay. For example, one no longer needs to suicide if they have the wrong weapon leading to a boss, or one doesn't have to struggle through nearly impossible sections if they possess the wrong weapon. Rather, the vampire killer is always an adequate weapon for whatever situation Simon comes across. And in this regard, I think I am okay with the added utility of the whip. In fact, it adds depth to the gameplay. Take the final fight with Dracula, for example. One can use the cross as a weapon to actually damage Dracula, and then hold the whip out to act like a shield against the incoming projectiles, rifling off the sub-weapon, then quickly getting the whip in position in the limited time window provided requires precision, and successfully pulling off the combo is satisfying. The second major change is the jumping. Much like Grant in Castlevania 3, Simon can now change directions in mid-air. Simon lacks the momentum and physics-based precision of, say, Mario, but like the games before it, Castlevania 4 never requires this much dexterity, so it isn't a problem. Still, I do find Simon's additional mobility to be a bit overstated. For example, regardless if the player taps the jump button or holds it, Simon's jump height is static. Additionally, speed or inertia cannot be changed. Simon simply changes directions at the same speed. It is useful, for sure, and makes jumping sections like the chandeliers in Stage 6 manageable, but but nimble, Simon is not. Finally, there are a few enhancements that make general navigation smoother too. First, Simon can now jump onto stairs. This can help make one recover from knockback or just ease the speed of forward progression. Second, if the stairs are placed at the end of a platform, Simon will automatically climb up or down them. In the classic games, one had to press the appropriate diagonal on the D-pad to engage the climb. While rare, I did accidentally walk off the ledge in previous titles, and my Muscle memory is occasionally present in the recorded footage. In either case, the ability to land on stairs and not walk off ledges are welcome additions and show the attention to detail the designers put into the gameplay. The rest of Castlevania 4 is a straightforward, back to its roots approach to the series. Gone are the non linear RPG elements from the second game and branching path multi character elements from the third title. Instead, the player will only control Simon through a linear set of levels on the way to 
to Count Dracula. And if I'm honest, I don't have any problems with this approach. Castlevania 4 is laser focused and avoids some of the pitfalls of the past games when the execution did not match the ambition. That isn't to say Castlevania 4 lacks ambition. The team seemed hell-bent on exploring the technical leap the Super Nintendo provided over the original NES. Right off the bat, the player is forced to go through a gate and begin navigating in the background. Foreground and background enemies can only interact with Simon when on the same plane. Sadly, this concept is never revisited in the adventure, but it does look cool. In addition to multiple scrolling layers, the designers also showed off the SNES's fabled Mode 7. This includes the famous horizontal tower section, this rotating level, and the scaling background acting as the boss, although this is certainly not the first time a moving background was used as a boss. While not especially impressive today, with some serious frame rate issues, a lack of color depth, and the inconsistent pixel size that comes with rotating something at such a low resolution, I do applaud the developers for experimenting with the hardware and exploring how such effects could be integrated as a gameplay element, rather than just zooming a title screen. No offense to Super Metroid, it is just the footage I have on hand. But back to the laser focused gameplay. Castlevania 4 is all about jumping and whipping through 11 stages, defeating bosses while slowly making progress towards the showdown with Dracula, who according to the western release has risen from his grave 100 years after the events of Simon's quest. Though Simon hasn't aged, suggesting he is still cursed or was bitten by a vampire, or who knows. Anyway, in Japan, this is a retelling of Simon's original 1691 adventure. Per usual, the opening cinematic of the game shows Simon at the gates of the expansive castle property before the game begins proper. The beginning moments lack any sort of enemies, letting one acclimate to the gameplay tweaks if needed before the adventure kicks off proper. The first stage also does a great job with the sub-weapons. For example, the holy water is first presented in these sections with the headless horses. The horse heads will travel right into the attack, giving a good use case for the unique weapon. On the next screen is the stopwatch, which is an extremely effective weapon on Medusa heads, stopping them in their tracks, preventing them from knocking the player into these flipping platforms. Another touch I absolutely love is that candles now drop health. In previous entries, health was only available in the form of wall meat or churches, but now candles can drop the life replenishing items. This is a little touch for sure, but I feel like the developers did a good job dropping little health pickups now and again, while still rewarding big health drops for those wanting to check every wall in the game. The first stage is where one will also learn the new grapple mechanic. The first hook appears with a safety net underneath, letting one come to grips with the engagement and release, before the game removes the safety net later on. While Castlevania 4 does include some tricky areas with multiple hooks, these always lead to bonus items, and multiple hook swings are never required for progression, which is a good thing because it isn't the smoothest mechanic in the world. I appreciate the restraint, and the designers never force the player to do something beyond what the controls are capable of. One area of Castlevania that did give me some issues at first, however, were the flipping platforms. Thankfully, the beginning of stage 4 offers a safe place to practice and learn their behavior. On this recorded run, I thankfully was able to navigate them without incident. Still, I suspect a few players got tripped up with the incredibly tight window one has to jump after landing on one. Moving along, I can't help but notice how Castlevania 4 is broken into three acts. The first five stages all take place outside of Dracula's castle. These five stages are relatively easy, not all of them even contain a boss, and do a decent job of teaching the player to try all of the sub-weapons and explore the full utility of the whip. The second act of the game begins when the player enters Dracula's castle. There is a noticeable increase in difficulty, enemy patterns become more complex, jumping requires better timing, the threat of falling into a bottomless pit becomes very real, and Castlevania 4 harkens back to the brutal difficulty the series was built upon. The final act is the build up to the final set of bosses, which include collapsing stairs and some brutal vertical scrolling sections, which will feel impossible until a player learns the devilish patterns 
crafted by the designers. There are three separate boss fights before the climb up to Dracula's castle, and then of course the battle with the ultimate baddie himself. I bring this up because I feel the area Castlevania 4 most excels at is the difficulty progression. In the original Castlevania, the toughest stage was the fourth one, with beefy enemies, tough enemy patterns, and a brutal boss. It made the fifth stage feel downright breezy. Same goes for Castlevania 3, with the lower path stage 7 being by far the most brutal level in the game, and the stages after it being rather tame in comparison. But in Castlevania 4, the final stage is unquestionably the hardest. It is a vertical trek up collapsing stairs which the player has to jump on, reinforcing the need for the player to master the act of landing on them in the first place. The player has to move quickly too as a hazard travels up the screen, offering a one-hit death to slow players. But not all threats are from below. The second half of the climb has the player jumping across moving platforms to make it to safe points on the screen, but one has to be mindful of the ceiling, which can also contain spikes which tear through Simon with a single strike. It feels like a proper final stage, testing the player's skills and offering a gauntlet to overcome before the final showdown. But everything here feels fair. The player has been forced to move quickly in previous stages. Stage 3-3 has collapsing blocks, forcing the player forward and collapsing blocks were introduced in a safe area right away in the first stage. Players hopefully notice they can land on stairs by holding up, though I don't actually think this was required before this point. Still, after two hours of play, one should feel comfortable with the navigation. And of course, pattern recognition has been slowly pushed on the player in the form of an ever-increasing array of deadly spiked platforms. This final stage feels like the culmination of everything Simon has been through, all wrapped up in the final epic section of the final epic stage. This difficulty progression can also be found with the bosses. Well, sort of. Truth be told, the bosses in Castlevania 4 are easy. This is usually because Simon can inflict damage faster than the boss has any hopes of dishing back. Even when the player fails to react with any sort of skill or precision, it probably doesn't matter, and if one hangs on to the cross sub-weapon, it is game over. However, things begin to pick up in Stage 7. Here, the boss does attack somewhat frequently, and getting into a little groove while dodging the flames on the ground can provide a semblance of satisfaction. Same goes for Stage 8, where one can whip at Frankenstein's monster's projectiles. While a better sub-weapon would shred these bosses, I do appreciate how a little strategy helps tip the battle in Simon's favor. The bats in Stage 9 are another good example. When hit, it or they drop projectiles. The player needs to strike the enemy in a strategic way to best avoid taking return damage. Again, not the most difficult thing ever, but things are starting to get engaging. Until one arrives at the mummy. At times, it feels like the mummy is trying to avoid damaging the player, which is bizarre. And there are obvious safe spots on the screen which further suck the challenge out of the encounter altogether. Thankfully, progression continues with the final boss rush. Slagra is easily my favorite boss in the game. He moves and strikes quickly, and one really has to react quickly to avoid return fire. Ducking becomes critical here, during both phases, first to avoid attacks, and in the second phase to dish out the pain. While jumping on these platforms isn't required to beat him, I did find they greatly assisted my timing, helping me to get into a good groove during the battle. The middle boss of this rush is a bit disappointing, although diagonal and upward slashes dull the monotony of the near constant horizontal whipping the game usually presents. Death ups the ante, however, as he usually does. To be honest, even on my fifth play, through, I never quite got into a proficient rhythm against him, though his projectile attacks are easier to whip down thanks to the increased reach of the whip and a more predictable starting point. I did eventually settle into a routine of whipping while he performed a scythe attack, which seemed to tip the damage exchange in my favor. Finally, there is Dracula. This is another two-phase affair, with the Count launching projectiles at Simon in the first phase, followed by an energy crash attack in the second phase. This is another strong fight easily up there with the very first encounter from 1986. What I like about it is how consistent it is, and how the patterns can be learned. These flames irritated the crap out of me on early playthroughs. However, they are not random, and there is a pattern to learn. They slowly charge at the player, but their descent is slower than their horizontal movement, and as they retain momentum once falling after being hit, one can control where they land. Eventually, I learned to strike the first from below, 
bow, then walk under the second one before striking, allowing each to land away from Simon, greatly mitigating their destruction. While my execution isn't always the best, and Dracula's random spawning is at times unfair, I again found myself getting into a good rhythm or groove and could reliably defeat the final boss without wanting to throw my controller. Dracula and Slogra are both great bosses, and easily some of the best bosses found in the franchise thus far. I do appreciate how there is a nice progression in difficulty from the beginning to the end, although part of me feels many of the early encounters don't provide much engagement or satisfaction. Perhaps I shouldn't expect bosses to be a test of skill to conclude the level. It is clear the designers didn't. Maybe it is more of a spectacle, something large and flashy, like fireworks, to reward the player for getting through the level's challenges. From this perspective, the bosses all serve their purpose just fine. Moving along is the iconic soundtrack. Theme of Simon is a strong opening track. Like the classic tracks before it, it feels like a Castlevania track, and like the graphics, it also very much takes advantage of the new hardware. The sample-based hardware of the Super Nintendo allow for more distinct instrument sounds, with less guessing or interpretation on my part. The track relies on the organ, I hope, to set the haunting mood. Different horned instruments are featured prominently, giving an orchestral feel to the piece, helping it feel grand and epic. Epic. It is an awesome way to begin the adventure, feeling slightly hopeful yet somber. It is memorable, but isn't a jingle. It is gothic yet heroic. After this, the soundtrack gets weird. I don't want to say bad, but there is something simplistic in many of the compositions. When I listen to them, I don't feel energy or emotion. They are not atmospheric either, and I can't place them in the game when I listen to them as standalone tracks. Are they period pieces? Is it lounge music? Jazz? I don't know. Instrument selection and melodies seem to change arbitrarily, and I have difficulty comprehending what the composers are trying to convey. Not all tracks leave me scratching my head though. Boss music is fantastic. The beats are rapid and capture the mood of a frantic boss encounter. It almost sounds like a college fight song, and I can envision a marching band using the track to amp up a crowd in a stadium. The depth and maturity often demonstrated in the NES trilogy is again alive and well, and I absolutely love it. However, Entrance Hall once again leaves me baffled. Maybe it is just me, but it reminds me of being at a baseball or hockey game. Surely I can't be the only one. Which is the exact opposite of chandeliers. Despite a similar instrument set, I now feel like I am in a classic monster movie, rather than a sporting event. I feel dread and danger, which is a much better representation of what Dracula's castle is all about. And as the chandeliers are mysteriously moving on their own, this is the type of music that will draw me into the game world. I'm not trying to be a Scrooge here, and Castlevania 4 does have a few standout tracks and great renditions of Bloody Tears, Vampire Killer, and Beginning. But as a whole, I don't find the soundtrack to be as moving, deep, atmospheric, technical, or well-pleasing as the games preceding it. A fine effort for sure, but I feel like some of the experimentation isn't as impactful as it could have been. Graphically, Castlevania 4 is alright. The art direction can be a mixed bag for sure. The bright primary colors are often at odds with the detailed sprites, failing to look realistic or artistic, lacking a central artistic theme and often lacking in contrast. While there are awesome touches of detail like this painting reaching out its arm to stop Simon, or this skeleton impaled on these spikes, many of the areas left me underwhelmed. The exception would be stage 8. The background is grungy and dirty, and the the shading on the bricks give them an almost wet appearance, like the dungeon is damp and musty. The foreground also pops against the background, giving my eye something to focus on, rather than everything sort of blending together. This better mirrors the earlier titles, where platforms popped against the background, always communicating clearly to the player what is going on. Again, I don't want to be too negative here, Castlevania 4 is a fine looking game, nothing is hideous or offensive, but I don't find it to be a looker either. The slowdown certainly 
doesn't do the game any favors either. What is the point of an epic run across collapsing platforms if the game grinds to a halt? It kinda ruins the impact. Despite the confusing soundtrack and bland visuals, I did find myself drawn to Castlevania 4. Despite replaying the game multiple times in a short period of time, fatigue never set in and I never dreaded pressing the start button at the title screen. What Castlevania 4 lacks in presentation, it more than makes up for with tight gameplay. The 8-way whip action is as good as advertised. Enemies are often placed at different levels, forcing the player to attack enemies in all new ways. While Castlevania 3 tried to evolve the jump and whip game play with all new characters to a varying degree of success, Castlevania 4 evolves the jump and whip formula in a much more balanced and consistent manner. With each playthrough, my personal success was based on me getting better at the game, recognizing patterns quicker, and learning more efficient way to defeat bosses. My success was no longer dependent on the path or side character chosen, and instead based on me, making for a much more engaging adventure. While some may prefer more variety, catering to different skills levels, I find the developers were better able to craft a tighter and more focused gameplay experience by stripping the game back to just the mechanics of a single character. The gameplay isn't always perfect though, with enemy placement occasionally not matching platform placement, surprise enemies attacking from off screen, the stair grabbing occasionally not working to my expectations, and spikes instantly killing the player. Thankfully, these moments are ultimately few and far between. What kept me coming back was the progression of the experience. While Castlevania 4 starts a bit slow, the back half of the game is terrific. I was challenged to learn patterns, execute tough jumps, find shortcuts through levels, and demonstrate proficiency with the jumping and whip to tackle difficult boss fights. I loved finding stage 4-4 was actually much shorter than I originally thought. After realizing it looped vertically, I discovered I could skip the vertical section when timing the platforms correctly. At first, I wondered why this one arch was lacking a chandelier, and then discovered it was the developers communicating there was something special about this one, leading to a secret room underneath. This platform in 9-2 initially seems like a trap, with a casket enemy not blocking any candles. But if one wanders up there, they'll discover a second treasure room, offering a way to recover health and hearts on a tricky level. The teaching moments in the game are excellent, from flipping platforms to hanging from the whip and the item placement in the beginning stages. These moments ease players into the action. Castlevania is tough, but rarely feels cheap or unfair. It doesn't feel relentless, but rather slowly builds to its epic conclusion. The action starts slow and breezy, before becoming intense. Maybe Castlevania 4 is a regression in difficulty, or maybe it is a better designed game, one that retains a high degree of challenge, but with less cheap moments moments, greatly reducing frustration and increasing engagement. Overall, I find Castlevania 4 is an excellent evolution of the Castlevania formula. The jumping tweaks are minor, but a welcome change. The 8-way whipping places less of a reliance on sub-weapons and keeps the action moving forward and the pacing quick. I never had to suicide if I had the wrong weapon, nor did I need to start a level over in order to obtain the correct one. I felt confident the vampire killer was enough to overcome any challenge. Health traps from candles and automatically walking up or down stairs further smooths out the gameplay. One can even walk forward while crouching, again, keeping the player moving forward towards the conclusion. Platform placement is thoughtful, requiring precision, but never pixel perfect precision, again, keeping the game moving forward and the pacing brisk. While I wish the presentation was better, with more artistic flair and less gimmicks, and I really wish I could hear in the soundtrack what everyone else seems to hear, I still ended up enjoying Castlevania 4. What it lacks in presentation, it more than makes up for with tight gameplay, engaging enemies, and levels designed around Simon's limitations. Combined with the perfect difficulty progression, and it makes for an immensely engaging experience that will satisfy most. Ultimately, Castlevania 4 is most definitely super.